Euromax highlights. And here's your host, Karin Helmstedt. Greetings from the German capital once again, and welcome to our Christmas highlights edition, shaping up this time with the following topics. Expelliarmus, follow in Harry Potter's footsteps at a wizard school in Poland. Ho, 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 Euromax reporter Axel Primavesi takes part in the Santa Winter Games. And scrap it with beautiful scrapbook pictures handmade in Germany. Well, for all those hardcore fans of Harry Potter who were still hungry for more after seven novels and eight films, there's yet another magic formula to get your kicks. For around 470 euros, you can take a course at the College of Wizardry in southwestern Poland. And while some might think that that sounds like a lark, it's actually a LARP, L-A-R-P. That's short for live action role play. And so even if you aren't really turning your neighbor into a newt, it's as close as you might get to it in this life. Casting a spell isn't always as easy as it looks. Here at the College of Wizardry, 130 participants are training to become magicians and sorcerers. Armed with a magic wand, students are transformed into valiant fighters who battle the forces of evil. Over three days, the students learn their craft through live-action role-playing, or LARP. The College of Wizardry attracts fans of fantasy from all over the world. Every day, when we're at our boring jobs, we imagine that we are a superhero, or we're a monster, or we're a wizard, and there's no opportunity to make that daydream a real thing. And then you come here, and you find all these people who are willing to take your daydream and say, yes, your daydream is happening. It is real. And there's something about that level of escapism that you just can't achieve anywhere else. You play for more than two days a character that can cast spells, uh, brew potions, uh, meet magical creatures. It's fantastic. The course is held once a year at Chocha Castle in southwestern Poland. The structure dates back to the 13th century, and it's the perfect setting for supernatural rituals whose origins are shrouded in the mists of time. There's a strict code of conduct, and it must be obeyed. Have I not made myself clear? Quiet, please! Let's, let's continue onwards. A magical school LARP that's in an actual goddamn castle. <laughs> and that, that does, of course, appeal, that feeling of having a 360-degree illusion all around you, and that helps you immerse into the world a lot more, and it makes the experience um, very real and very intense. The students choose one of five fields to study. They include courses that teach healing skills or how to break a curse. There are also lessons in arithmancy, which deals with the magical properties of numbers. Here in the dungeon, they're learning how to drive away evil spirits. One of the school's more popular courses is alchemy, taught by Shimon Baruta. He teaches the students how to use chemistry to affect magical transformations. Alchemy is important for, for, for making different, different kinds of potions. I mean, like love potions, uh, uh, changing the mood, uh, or protect yourself from uh, something. The purpose can be bad and good ones, yeah? So we can make someone uh, feel bad or good. Usually it's connected with emotions. But even the most powerful magic can't make the students' homework disappear. Their main task is to master the magic wand. And that takes a lot of practice. And if they forget some of the magic words, they can always look them up here. Every student gets a copy of his textbook, a sort of sorcerer's Bible. It is a difference between uh, theatrical or cinematic uh, scenography. Because here on LARP, we have to be able to enter the room, to read the book, to uh, use the particular set of items we need. 
it has to be touchable, usable. Sometimes we incorporate uh, also smells, so uh, we have scented rooms so people can associate that on uh, some kind of uh, unconscious level. Here at the Fireball game, the students present themselves in their best wizard and sorcerer costumes. There's a team of costume designers and makeup artists on site to perfect the look. What I really, really like about this whole uh, thing is when players come for the first time, for example, and put their costume on, and then they can see how they change. Like in one moment, there are somebody else, they, they start to behave differently, they walk different, they posture change, and like the costume is like the most important thing to get into the role. A lot of students take their roles very seriously, and to get into the spirit of the courses, you have to be a pretty good actor as well. You can read a book, you can picture it in your mind, you can watch a movie, you can kind of emphasize with the characters and follow the story and you can see what's going on and hear them. But at LARP you can feel it. You're engaging all five senses and you're not just consuming culture, you're creating culture. The students have made new friends here. It's been a wonderful experience. But the precise details of what they learned behind the walls of Chocha Castle will forever remain secret. Well, no doubt Santa Claus is just recovering from his long Christmas Eve journey. And all over the world, Santa impersonators will be breathing a sigh of relief too, including our own Euromax Santa, otherwise known as our reporter, Axel Primavesi. Well, along with a host of international competitors, he tested his mettle this year at a special event called the Santa Winter Games. They take place every year in Galivare, Sweden. So let's see how he measured up representing Germany. This is Lapland in Sweden's far north. Lots of nature, very few people, and peace and quiet. Except in Gelivare at the Santa Winter Games. The big day kicks off with a parade through the small town. And I'm right in the middle of it all. Christine Schauer is next to me with her daughter. We are representing Germany together. Christine and I have just met. She's lived in Norway for many years and often appears there as a female Santa Claus. But we don't have much time to discuss strategy. Can you give me any tips for the Santa Winter Games? Well, the Asians are considerably younger, so they'll be faster. Yeah, and yes, we have to obey the rules, you're right. <laughs> yeah. One of the events is dancing to Christmas music. We are hoping to wreck our points with a polished performance. The three of us come up with a routine in record time. Back at the games, the crowd is gathering on a square in the center of town, anxiously awaiting Santas from around the world. And from Germany, Frontiskla. I'm very nervous, unlike Christine, who's a regular here. The first event is lassoing reindeer, theoretically at any rate. Team Sweden goes first. Pay close attention and then just do what they do. Close, but not quite there. Sadly, all of Christine's four attempts fail. But Team Hong Kong manages three successful tosses, probably due to the fact that Santa Apple did a secret practice session. We continue on to the next event without a break, delivering presents, or rather, raw eggs. I think you definitely have to carry the sack on your back. It's much too dangerous on the sled, and I think it will be difficult in the chimney. Team France goes first, followed by Hong Kong and China. 
because I can't ski, Christine has to compete. Then I take my turn on the sled, apparently completely forgetting my own advice. But all our eggs arrive under the tree intact. And we get bonus points for a bold climb up the narrow chimney. Christina, what do you think? It went pretty well. Yeah, we got it done at least. I'm optimistic about our chances. Because now it's time to dance. There are bonus points for those who get the spectators to dance along with them. But Christine and I are so focused on our choreography that we forget about the possible bonus. The current standings have us in fourth place. And finally, the grand finale with three events. A porridge eating contest is one of them. But more importantly, now I can finally put the secret contents of my suitcase to use. The final event is Christmas tree decorating and we simply have to win that. I was lucky to be paired with Christine, who really goes for it in the events where I would have probably failed. After the porridge eating contest, we move on to wrapping presents, tied up with a bow, of course. And now we come to decorating the tree. Along with the glass topper, I've also brought traditional handmade wooden ornaments from Germany's Our Mountains. And of course, big glass baubles. No one can beat that, right? Hey, we've done a great job! Then the jury deliberates. The final bonus points are awarded for the best tree. And the winner is Team Sweden! Yeah! It fills in my heart. It was, it is, I'm, be, I'm being so glad for this. We are the first Swedish Santa that wins this ever. So uh, we couldn't be more happy than we are. And we're proud. Yeah. My disappointment at our fourth place finish disappears in the cozy warmth of a campfire. And I've certainly learned a lot. The day draws to a close with a group sleigh ride, accompanied by the Chinese version of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Well, in the frenzy of today's digital world, we often resort to sending our Christmas greetings via email or, in a pinch, even via text message. But once upon a time, people did place great store in beautiful paper either in card or in letter form. Well, there is, in fact, a stationery firm here in Germany that does a booming business with clients in places as far away as Scandinavia, Asia and the US. It specializes in old-fashioned scrapbook pictures, as they're called, where the whole beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Images from the 19th century. Cut out, embossed and, especially at Christmas, decorated with fine glitter. Scrapbook pictures have been around for over 150 years and they still sell all over the world. They're the absolute antithesis to the modern day in which we live, which is often marked by violence and also where everything has to be faster, bigger, louder, more extreme. With our pictures, we aim to give our customers the exact opposite experience. In den Menschen auch erzeugen, auch im Bewusstsein. Ralf Thorsten Freihoff and his sister Anne Ruth run the EF Glanzbilder Company. For decades, Ralf Thorsten has been collecting old scrapbooks from collectors. He also collects illustrated autograph books, which often contain complex collages made up of countless individual images. 
Nein, ich habe also nie ein eigenes Buch. I never kept an autograph book of my own. But I started very early on as a teenager collecting scrapbook pictures. I went to flea markets here in Germany and also in France. And what I bought back then has now become the basis for my collection today. It was in 1948 that Ralf Torsten's father, Ernst Freyhoff, set up the company. In the 1980s, he began not only selling scrapbook pictures, but also producing them. The idea for the business was born in one memorable moment, shortly after the Second World War. Er bekam 15 Glanzbilder. He received 15 scrapbook pictures and was intending to swap them for something else again or to sell them. But he happened to show them to an older lady and as he was showing them to her, he noticed how her eyes lit up. And it was a key moment for him. Based on the reaction of this woman, he decided to set up a company that would deal exclusively in these pictures. Die mit diesen Bildern handelt. The motifs from his own collection now often form the basis for new arrangements of images. A specialized firm scans in the original. Ralf Torsten then puts together individual images to create a new arrangement. Every now and then I'll hear from older people in particular who send me entire albums. They write something like, we hope this will be in good hands and that it will be preserved as an historical document, which is what it is. Every new sheet involves a lot of detailed work done by hand. After being printed, embossed and cut out, the spaces in between are punched out meticulously. You get a feel for it in time. When I first started, occasionally some would rip and tear a bit because I didn't know how many sheets to take at once to make it work. It always varies. Sometimes it's difficult to punch them out, sometimes easier. It's different every time. Finally, a glossy finish is applied to the paper. The founder of the company developed his own machine for the process, which remains a company secret. We're only allowed to film brief excerpts of the machine at work. The glitter effect is produced with extremely fine pieces of glass. If you're going to use a machine, you have to have a product that can tolerate being put through a machine. And as you can imagine, these sheets are quite fragile once all the holes have been punched out, so there's the first problem. But the company doesn't just offer sheets of scrap pictures. It's always coming up with new products, such as stand-up vintage greeting cards. Ralf Torsten Freyhoff is convinced these pictures will never go out of fashion. It's so nice to see young children standing in front of our market stand completely fascinated and telling their parents they want to have pictures like that too. The scrapbook pictures still bring joy these days, and not just at Christmas. There are images for every occasion and every taste. Well, some languages have words for which there's no single or direct translation. And in Danish, hygge is one of those words. Now, it denotes a ritual enjoying of life's simple pleasures, such as spending time with friends and family, going for a walk, or perhaps simply enjoying the warm glow of some candles. Well, they all signify hygge, which also implies a cozy kind of security. Now, this Danish art de vivre has recently grown in popularity and spread to the English-speaking world. And since the Danes are are always ranked the happiest people in the world, we thought we'd check in with them for a lesson in the art of hygge. 
Surveys indicate that the Danes are the happiest people on earth. In fact, the UN's World Happiness Report puts Denmark at the top of the list. What is it about the Danes that makes them such happy people? Mike Viking has written a book about all this, and he believes he has the answer. It has to do with togetherness. It has to do with the art of creating a good atmosphere. It's about equality. It's about savoring simple pleasures. I think we also see Hygge as something inherently Danish. I think we see it as part of our national identity, the same way the Americans see freedom. We think of Hygge as something uh, as part of our DNA. The word hygge means being comfortable and contented, often while enjoying the simple pleasures of life. Here are a few examples. It's having a cup of warm chocolate or warm tea and some biscuits at some, and a talk who go a little bit deeper than normal. Chilling in the couch. At home we take a candle. Hygge is also maybe watching a film or reading a book. Mike Viking is the CEO of the Happiness Research Institute in Copenhagen. He says that the Danes' unique attitude toward life plays a major role in their sense of well-being. We've been curious about why Denmark does well in the happiness rankings, and we've looked at the political system, and that's a big part of the explanation. You know, high level of trust, you know, social security, universal health care, but that also explains why the other Nordic countries do well. So we, we wanted to understand why does Denmark do better than, than Sweden, Finland, Iceland and, and, uh, and, and Norway. Spending quality time with friends and family or enjoying homemade cinnamon buns, that's hygge. The Danes really love Christmas time. Traditional apple tarts are on sale at Christmas markets throughout Copenhagen. So is Glug, or Danish mulled wine. The Tivoli Amusement Park is decked out in a sea of lights. Mike Viking says winter is the peak season for Hygge. While it is practiced throughout the year, I think for the winter period, it becomes almost a survival strategy. It's a way of getting the best out of a time of year, which is dark and cold and wet and we're forced indoors. The best place to experience hygge is in Danish homes. The Danes have more living space per person than any other European country, and they make their surroundings as comfortable as possible. Lighting is important too. There's a reason why we use uh, twice as much candle wax as number two in Europe, which is Austria, because we enjoy lighting that is at the low end of the temperature scale. So we enjoy warmer, more diff soft, diffused lights uh, to create a, a nicer atmosphere in a room. The Danes also like to have nice things around the house. Northern Europe is known for its design concepts, like the lamps of Paul Henningsen and the chairs of Arna Jakobsen and Kore Klint. But do these items really make people happy? The notion or the concept of hygge is something that for Danes is just a word or uh, describes a, a situation or a, a state of mind more than a design. I don't think you can say that a design is a designer is is uh, doing something to create hygge, but I think it's something that's more ingrained or maybe internalized in our culture. A simple walk outside can also be hygge. It costs nothing and it makes you feel good. Hygge shouldn't be about consumerism. You could also use hygge as the get out of jail card. Uh, if something is too expensive, if you walk into a restaurant, it's too expensive. You could say, shouldn't we find a place that's more hygge-ly? And your friends will go, yeah, let's find a place that's more hygge-ly. So hygge should be inexpensive because it's about equality and it's about simple pleasures. Danes call that special, cozy Christmas feeling Julehuge. And the focus is not on expensive presents, it's on being together with family and friends. It's the true spirit of Christmas, and not just in Denmark. 
Well, that brings us to the end of this edition of our highlights. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope that wherever you are, you've managed a bit of downtime and hygge over this holiday season. All the best for the final stretch of the year, and look forward to seeing you back here in 2017. Until then, tschüss und auf Wiedersehen.